There are lots of seats towards the front. I think the Canadians have taken the uh, very uh, British habit of sitting at the back, whereas the Americans sit at the front. <laughs> Commendably so. <laughs> Please take your seats. Abari is at Alasiri. I've just said good afternoon to Ruth uh, Onyango. Asante <laughs> sana. Please come along in and take your seats. Well, I think we'll start then, so uh, I'm not going to make long introductions to the excellent two speakers that I am chairing for this afternoon. It's a very great pleasure to welcome uh, to the uh, stand Sarah Gurr, who's uh, late of Oxford University, but now at the very, very vibrant uh, uh, University of Exeter, and you may not know where the University of Exeter is. It's uh, partly in Exeter and partly uh, further into Cornwall. Uh, it's probably just about as far from the European Union as you can get in the British Isles uh, and still call yourself uh, in England. Uh, but in fact, it receives great benefit by uh, the European Union, having within its campus, campuses a development site. Uh, so I'll say no more, but Sarah, please give us your talk. I'm not going to say your title because I think you've changed it. <laughs> So thank you very much. I'm very honored to be invited by John and also by Morris, and I'm also very grateful for their friendship and mentorship over the years. So I understand that I have competition this afternoon in the form of an adolescent pop star, Justin Bieber. So I hope that instead of listening to him, you might listen to a middle-aged English woman instead. Okay, so I'm going to talk about major threats to global agriculture, and I'm very particularly going to talk about fungi as they're challenging global food security. And I'm going to do it by describing some of the work that my group have been doing since we left Oxford in 2013 to move down to the University of Exeter. So I'm going to talk very briefly about the challenges of facing global food security, particularly about crop pests and pathogens, with regards to fungi and oomycetes, which I'll explain in a minute. A bit about the global distribution and movement of crop pests and pathogens with a focus on fungi. A bit about fungal emergence and adaptation. And then some emerging stories of emerging problems, which I'd like you not to tweet or stream, and I'll talk about it when we get there. And then I'll just conclude with some comments about the way ahead. So I really hardly need to rehearse so much of what we've heard already about the global expansion of our population, rising from 7.2 billion to perhaps 9.2 billion over the next 50 years or so, with 86% of these new peoples going to be clustered in the developing world, eating predominantly rice and wheat and maize. So these three crops alone cover about 40% of our global agricultural land. And in terms of area harvested and production, the major calorific crops that feed the world are wheat, rice, maize, soybean, and a rising star, the potato. So we have an expanding population, and we're going to at least need to double global food production over the next 50 years. But we also face a series of other challenges, such as water crises, such as deluge, deluge and drought, spiraling energy costs, land degradation, whether it be by urbanization or by soil erosion, volatile political conditions such as those that have led to the recent hike or spikes in prices of foodstuffs, climate change, and also pests and pathogens. For despite mitigation, and by that I mean by the deployment of inbred disease resistance genes and the widespread use of, for example, antifungals, we still lose between 10 or 12 and 23% of our crops each year, year on year, due to pests and pathogens. 
and we also lose another 10% post-harvest to various diseases. And of the various pests and pathogens, it is the fungi which are the pro most prolific agents of plant disease, or so we've always thought. So in the very first meta-analysis we did, and probably the most simplistic of all, one small part of this paper published in 2012, we did a meta-analysis looking at different databases, searching with different terms, to find that indeed fungi do cause the most problems in terms of global food security and also ecosystems health. And as you can see from here, they take about 67% of the pie. So in terms of calorific crops, we have wheat, rice and maize, soybean and also potatoes. And this also described, this article, the five most devastating crop pathogens. The wheat stem rust, rice blast, corn smack and soybean fungi and also the honorary fungus, the oomycete, which causes potato light bl late blight, Phytophthora infestans. Now an oomycete is not a fungus, it's a fungal-like creature more really related to yellow-brown algae than to fungi. But for the point of this talk, it's an honorary fungus. So here I simply worked out the loss in crops at low-level and high-level diseases. This is not during epidemic diseases. This is the low-level and high levels that we see year upon year in our fields. And taking into account the calorific value of the flower of each of these crops, I worked out that we need in, lose enough to feed between 600 and 4,000 million people year on year due to these five crop diseases alone. If we had the truly apocalyptic scenario of each of these becoming an epidemic simultaneously, we would only be able to produce enough calories to feed 38% of the extant population today. I also want to add into this the disease called Septoria triticide blotch. It didn't feature in the paper, but it refers to something I want to talk about with regard to Canadian agriculture later in the talk. This disease is caused by the fungus Zymos septoria triticae, and it's the most devastating fungal disease of wheat in Europe. The wheat value, or the harvest of wheat in Britain, is worth 2.2 billion UK pounds. And each year we lose between 5 and 10% of the crop to septoria triticae blotch despite mitigation, so having bred disease resistance and also using antifungals. I worked out that the cost benefit of disease control of this by spraying with fungicides returns a value of between two and a half and seven and a half fold on the money put into the crop. Unfortunately, this fungus has developed disease resistance to the inbred resistance genes and also to the antifungals that are sprayed and now we have fungicide resistance emerging throughout the wheat fields in Europe. But I'll come back to this one. And I also later want to give you two small stories, one about coffee rust and also one about Panama disease of bananas. So these fungi which cause commodity or food crises through the world. And just to complete it in terms of food security and ecosystem health, here are fungi which have actually changed, or oomycetes that have actually changed the landscape of the world. The first two diseases, Dutch elm and chestnut blight, are almost historical diseases. We lost 100 million elms to Dutch elm disease in Britain and also Northern America from 1974 onwards. And chestnut blight has led to the loss of 3.4 billion chestnut trees in Northern America alone. Today, we are much vexed by the Phytophthora's causing southern oak death, uh, starting off in California, and also in the eucalyptus forests in Australia, Jarrah dieback. And pertinent to agriculture or forestry in Canada is the fungus which causes blue stain vectored by the pine beetle, which has led to the loss of 12.8 million hectares of lodgepole pine. So here, in association with a scientist from Tufts University, we worked out how much loss there is of absorbed CO2 just to these five diseases alone. So quite staggering. So I want to turn now to some data, and I want to talk about the global distribution and movement of crop pests and pathogens with a focus on fungi. And this was, work was done with an association with Dan Berber, who came with me from Oxford to Exeter as a senior research fellow. So I asked a series of very simple questions, and they are, what is the global distribution of pests and pathogens? Are they on the move? 
Can we predict the greatest threats, and when and where will these threats occur? So the second meta-analysis again came up with a series of hypotheses and conjectures, with the first being the most simplistic, saying quite obviously that the number of pathogens should reflect the volume and diversity of agriculture in a given country. We also conjectured that you would find more pests at the equator, because here you would expect a latitudinal gradient in species richness, as you see with wild species. And finally, we conjectured that there would be fewer pests on islands, because the theory of island biogeography suggests that lower immigration rates and higher extinction rates exist on islands. So to do this, we built unbiased, iterative, generalized linear models. And we were really fortunate because we were able to tap into the CABI database, which I know Andrea described to you this morning. So the CABI database started in 1890, and it is observations of diseases around the world. It became robust by about 1960, with all the individual observations qualified by at least two observations. So we looked at pests in countries, 85,725 records, looking at 168 different crops according to the United Nations Food and Agricultural Database. We worked out for every country its gross domestic product per capita. We looked at a country's investment in research and development. And then we looked at the trade data. And here we found that what one country claims to export to another, another country does not claim the same values. So we had problems with this data. We also looked at weather data. And we classified every country in the world according to whether it is an island, landlocked, or coastal. And I want to show you some facts from this data and also some predictions. So starting with facts, if you look along the bottom axis, you can see per capita GDP and up the vertical axis, pests per tonne of agricultural production. Each point on this graph represents a country with the islands being closed circles, landlocked open triangles, and coastal regions as squares. And what you can see is exactly what we did not predict, which is that there are more pests on islands than in landlocked nations. The top two dots, the islands at the top right, represent Australia and New Zealand, which is truly surprising because they have probably the most robust biosecurity protocols in the world, but it looks as though they came into being a bit too late. So this also allows us to do some predictions so here we're looking at the global distribution of pests and pathogens by country. And I want to give you two examples. And I want to start with Myanmar, so previously Burma. So Myanmar is an unbelievably uh, poor country. 54% of its economy runs on rice. It has a zero spend on research and development and a very low GDP. At the moment, this country reports 371 pests and pathogens. But if you take a more idealistic approach and you look at the USA with good GDP and a very good level of spend on research and development, and you train your model on America, you can predict which countries in the world are underestimating their pests and pathogen load. So for example, Myanmar are underpredicting by about 300 pests and pathogens. And indeed, Canada seems to be missing about 100. The only country in the world that seems to be overpredicting is France. So I imagine that they went out sampling for pests and pathogens after rather a good lunch and rather a lot of good red wine. <laughs> However, this gives us a good global look at pest and pathogen distribution by country. So our next meta-analysis asked, are crop pests and pathogens on the move in the face of climate change? And again, we went back to the CABI database and we looked at to see whether pests and pathogens are moving. And what I should say, in everything that we do, we have done the most robust mathematical way we can think of in conjunction with mathematicians to take out observational bias. So with regard to this, are pathogens moving? I want to draw your attention here, not to all the pests and pathogens, but to just the graph on the bottom right, which shows the passing of the decades and the distance that fungi in this example have moved from the equator, which is the red line. So fungi are on the move. And to do this, we took residuals of linear models of GDP, records per country, land area, agricultural production, and we randomized the data a thousandfold to remove temporal trends. So the summary to this piece of work 
was that there is indeed a poleward shift for many crop pests and pathogens with increasing numbers at higher latitudes. And this will have quite a big impact on how we control our pests and pathogens. Fungi, for example, are moving at almost eight kilometers per year in the Northern Hemisphere, and they're accelerating. They are moving in concert with climate change. So the next meta-analysis asked, can we predict when crops will saturate with pathogens? So when will all pathogens have evaded all possible hosts and in which countries? So which ones are going to pose the most immediate problems and when will they arrive? So to do this, I first looked at pest distribution models used in agriculture and also for the movement of animal and human diseases where state observational pest observations in terms of crops and high resolution crop production and climate and environment are taken into account. But these were not sufficient, we decided, to account for everything that we wanted to look at in terms of plant disease biology. So we've done it rather differently. So again, we've gone back to our 2000 pests, but at this time we've looked at their distribution at both the national and the subnational level We've looked again at the 168 crops from the FAO, but here we have matched all pests and pathogens to host specificity. So we've characterized them according to whether they're generalist or specialists. And what we've done is some fancy stats using correspondence analysis. So we've done ordination of countries by comparing like with like and some fancy maths. Just looking at the saturation for each pest being the number of countries infected, over the number that could potentially be infected and the saturation for each country being the number of pests present over the number that could occur. So what you're looking at here is the current status. So you can see as the axes expand, we at the moment have strongly regionalized pests and pathogens. So the bluey colors of the Northern Americas, the greenies of the Latin America, Eurasia is purple pink and the Old World territories are on the bottom right. So this is almost a rhetorical argument. What it tells us at the moment is that the assemblages of pests are still strongly regionalized, but that climate change will indeed influence pest distribution in the future. So the question that everyone asks is, what will this movement lead to? So which pathogens will pose the most immediate problems and when will they arrive? So here again, you're looking at the passing of the decades on the horizontal axis, and the saturation of crops with pathogens on the vertical axis. And you can see from the pale blue line that America is going quickly towards full saturation, and Canada is also following at an extremely alarming rate. In terms of the UK, it seems to me that over the next 50 years or so, all the crops we currently have are going to be saturated with the pathogens known to be specific to them. So the question is, which pathogens are leading the front? And again, it's the fungi followed closely by the oomycetes. And within the fungi, our greatest threat in a global term seem to be the powdery mildews. We're also very much threatened by the march of root knot nematodes. So I want to talk a little bit about what's going on in terms of global agriculture, in terms of emergence and adaptation. So we know that at the moment, global changes and climate change and trade are creating new disease challenges. That is, new hosts with new pathogens and new variants of old foes. But the problem is that modern agriculture is also forcing new variants of extant pathogens. Let me explain why. So the question here is how easy is it for a new pathogen or a virulent isolate to emerge in an agricultural system? What are the drivers and what are the accelerators? Is this process evolutionary or is it forced by the hand of man? So what's the evidence and what is the threat level? So what I've simply drawn together here is a table of the evolutionary drivers in terms of such mechanisms as host pathogen domestication, host hops, hybridization and horizontal gene transfer. So an example of host pathogen domestication is in the foothills of the Himalayas where the rice blast pathogen has co-evolved with its host rice. Host hops are very pertinent to the press this week because we've had this tragedy where the rice fields in Bangladesh are being burned because we've had a host hop where we've had rice blast hopping from millet onto rice and most recently, 24 years ago, from rice onto wheat in Brazil. 
We've got genome fusions, such as shown by the Phytophthora species, the new species on alder trees. And we've got horizontal gene transfer, with a notable example of a toxin gene becoming acquired by a different wheat pathogen in Australia. But more serious, really, is since the Green Revolution, we have forced the emergence of new variants of old pathogens. So if you look at the top right, we've got the disease triangle, a triangle which describes the disease prevalence being greatest when the host is susceptible, the pathogen is abundant and virulent, and the environment predisposes the crop to maximal disease. What we've effectively done is to make this equilateral triangle scalene by fast-forwarding evolution of the pathogen. Let me explain how and why with an example. So the picture you're seeing is of GFP-labeled spores with an lesion of septoria triticide blotch. If you look at this pathogen and then you think about it arriving in a monoculture, it has this most wonderful food source, the host, immediately available to it. It's a fast cycling pathogen with a very plastic genome. It's got 21 chromosomes of which a core of sweet are disposable and some are not disposable. Its genome is littered with SNPs, with polymorphisms, with effectors, and also with retro DNA. It can fast forward to evolve new strains unbelievably quickly. So now we have a crop which is guarded by one or two resistance genes, which we spray regularly with single target site antifungals. So if you add up the numbers of spores within this spore structure and multiply it by the lesions per hectare, you find 10 to the power 10, 10 100,000 million spores per hectare. So this plastic genome has fast forwarded this, propelled this fungus to evolve uh, resistance to the fungicides and also to overcome the disease resistance genes. So I want to go now to some emerging stories, and I ask please that you don't tweet these because one of them will be what I think. But we need some more fundamental research to meet the upcoming challenges. In terms of pathogen biology, we really do need to better understand infection strategies. So it is totally horrific that some of us, and I have to admit that I am a molecular biologist and not a modeler, many of us have done huge amounts of molecular biology, transcriptomics, metabolomics, etc without really understanding the infection strategies of certain pathogens or having good enough life history descriptions. So we need a better understanding of infection strategies and we need better insight into genome architecture. We need to be able to pathogen detect better and we need to be able to monitor better. So we need to develop antibody and molecular based technologies to look at detecting pathogens in virgin lands or new hosts and tracking populations both temporally and spatially. And we've developed an ELISA antibody kit, as you can see on the right-hand side, in this instant to detect the presence of ash dieback fungus. We need better disease forecasting and better epidemiological models, and we need to give far better assistance to developing countries to develop quarantine and pathogen monitoring. We need new antifungals. We are so reliant on single target site antifungals, and as you can see with the plasticity of the fungal genomes, these are rapidly overcome. We need to decrease reliance on these single target chemistries, and we need to define new ones. We also need to agree on protocols for rotational use of our very precious fungicides, which are still precious in the field. And to do that, we've recently come up with a chemistry, and it's on the right-hand side, which is so-called organic, it really isn't organic, which we can use at very low dose and which seems to be very antifungal at low dose and which also, not shown in this slide, is useful because it boosts immunity within the plant. We do need to understand also the mode of action of antifungals. And how are we going to do that? Well, in Exeter, we're extremely fortunate because we have a very good cell biologist, Giro Steinberg, and his specialty has been, for example, with Zymoseptoria, as well as Eustilago and Magnoporthus, so rice blast, corn smut, and Septoria triticide blotch. He has managed to tag almost every organelle within these fungi 
with fluorescent proteins. So what you're looking at the picture on the left is the nuclei tagged here with green fluorescent protein. And this will allow us to not only understand the infection strategy, but also will be allow us to look at fungicide development by understanding mode of action. Let me show you an example of this. And here I pick a relatively old-fashioned fungicide called dodine, which I know was used quite extensively to control apple scab in Northern America and Canada until recently, and it stopped being used because of emergence of resistance. Curiously, on the frac listing, it doesn't have a proper description. It has vagaries, thinking that it might disrupt the outer membrane of the cell, or it might indeed stop intracellular reactions. So very vague. So what I want to show you here is the power of live cell imaging, here using to test the fluidity of the outer cell membrane. So what we've done here is tagged the membrane with a fluorescent marker, GFP. And here, what we've done in the corn smut fungus is by laser, shooting lasers at it, you can then look to see how long it takes a photobleached region to mend. And I'm really sorry, but my movies haven't embedded so what you would expect to see in the next one is the difference between the control and the dodine treatment, where the dodine reduces the fluidity of the membrane. So here we have some very powerful tools which will allow us to look for mode of action of various antifungals. So just to return and to complete the list, from the crop perspective, we're obviously going to need to look for new sources of resistance and pyramid resistance genes. We're going to have to look for QTLs, and we're going to try and look for higher yields from monocultures with less reliance on high yields from monocultures by planting mixed cultivars. We need to look for de plant defense activators, and we definitely need to invoke the use of cisgenic plants, so GM. So what is so precious about this meeting is the impact it will have on raising awareness to the needs of both the developed and the developing world but I feel it come upon each and every one of us to raise public and political awareness and be able to articulate our arguments succinctly to politicians to influence both national and international policy. Also, when I looked and did some sums comparing the amount of money spent on crop disease versus human disease, it is truly horrific. We spend almost nothing on the world stage on crop diseases, so we need to redress the balance better. And of course, we need to ensure succession. But none of those who follow us will be able to be, as we were, gene jockeys, where you knocked out individual genes, because the scientists of the future will have to be much more holistically trained. And with regard to plant disease, they'll need to be epidemiologists. They'll be able to climate forecast, look at surveillance, track molecular evolutionary patterns, and also be well informed of host pathogen biology. I couldn't find the phenotype of a plant woman doctor. I hope I don't look too much like this, apart from having perhaps the same long nose. So that's all I want to say. I just want to thank you for your attention and to thank those who've helped me in this work. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much indeed, Sarah, and particularly for sharing those unpublished and delicate results, but very exciting results with us. So questions, we have lots of time. Morris, would you like to go to the microphone, please? So Sarah, yeah, obviously you mentioned a lot of threats there. Um, right early in your talk, you talked about the jump uh, of Magnaportha uh, from rice to wheat, uh, becoming wheat blast fungus now. How dangerous is that gonna be because wheat is so um, distributed around the world in different uh, in, in different temperate zones, um, one could imagine that that is a massive threat if it were to take hold. Yes, yeah, so there are sequencing projects, um, one in Exeter, one in Africa, looking at variations. So, Magnaportha arisei causes rice blast disease, but it belongs to a complex called Magnaportha gracia, and that complex actually infects over 50 different grasses and sedges. So, not only is wheat vulnerable. But if we fast forward evolution, I think other cereals will also be vulnerable. So it is a bit of a nightmare. Hmm. Next question, please. Yes, thank you. Very interesting talk. You made a, just a real quick comment about root knot nematodes. And that's mm -hmm. very interesting because obviously 
being in the soil, they're somewhat buffered from the weather and climate a little bit, but also they're subject to the environment of the soil. So in the United States, we have northern root knot nematodes and southern root knot nematodes, which are a different species. So what do you think is going on there that, that they seem to be moving so quickly? So root knot nematodes are the only example on the graphs that I showed when I singled out fungi that they're actually on the move, but some of the species are actually moving nearer to the equator. And I think if you look at a root knot nematode as opposed to a cyst nematode, the cysts are moving quickly, but the root knots are not moving quite so fast. And they're probably not moving so fast because of the gelatinous matrix that the eggs are laid in, which seem to be incredibly vulnerable to desiccation as well as to heat. But I don't have a total answer for your question. They, they are moving, but they are very problematic, not least because the Meloidogynes have a very broad host range, as you're probably well aware. Lawrence Kane. Lots of questions because I'm not a very good plant pathologist, but anyway. Um, so, um, the, 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 the second thought I had was uh, concerning, um, oh, right at the end, hold on a second. Ah, I've lost, uh, I've lost the disease. Is there another question? And it'll just come back to me. Was it about septoria or a tan spot? Or? Um, no. It wasn't about septoria, no. Okay. I'll, 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 well, I'll I can ask it. one while okay. you're thinking, Morris. So uh, the Urmycetes inheriting the world, I mean, that's an interesting story, isn't it? I mean, they have very vulnerable uh, stages in their life cycle which, as you say, makes them look like other organisms, like animals, yes. the zoospores. Yes. It's always intrigued me that that's not been more of a, a, a profitable target uh, because, you know, it's the mobility of insects that we target with the nervous system and with the chemicals that regulate where they go and what they do. The zoospores seem to be open for that. Yes, I'm surprised there isn't control. So the zoospores are like a kidney bean shape and they have two flagella, one is whiplash and one is tinsel, so one's got hair, so they can swim and they are chemotactically attracted to the plant roots. You would think at that stage they are unbelievably vulnerable, but yet we don't target them very effectively with any chemical treatment. Well, I would be most excited to collaborate on that. <laughs> uh, <yes>. Wonderful. <laughs> Morris, do you want to make a comeback, or uh, shall we leave it till the coffee break? Do you want to say anything else, Sarah? I don't seem to have any more questions. No, but thank you for... Ah, here's one. Oh. Good. Please, make your way to the microphone. Give yeah, that was a great uh, talk. Uh, yeah, I understand, like, you know, and... Uh, is there any possibility of, you know, like, uh, in our uh, rhizosphere or in the soil, to have those beneficial pathogens, microorganisms, like bacteria, fungi, we can culture them and, you know, like then inoculate them to the soil so that they can destroy those parasitic pathogens. So, so you want to release into the soil something like, you know, biocontrol to stop nematodes? Yeah, biocontrol of those mm. uh, Yes, so uh, we know, yes, there, there are fungi which actually lasso the heads of nematodes, and that works reasonably well, but not when you take it out into the field. So it works in glass houses. And that was a, a really exciting story in the 80s and 90s, but it's never really become a practical disease control way. But I'm sure there are antagonistic bacteria, et cetera. And also there are some fungi which antagonize other fungi, such as trichodermas, that we could use. Our problem is in vast agricultural fields, of course, we spray antifungals. So not only do we get rid of some advantageous fungi, mycorrhizae and endophytic fungi, um, in our quest to make a clean crop, so we've kind of skewed evolution slightly, but I do think biological control will become more and more fashionable. That's a good point. So if I remember correctly, like, you know, Professor Higa from Japan, he had that effective micro uh, technology, EM technology, effective microorganism technology, EM technology. They were culturing about uh, 100 of these uh, microorganisms from bacteria to fungi to oomycetes and Ascomycetes and like, and, and then uh, spray that stuff on the fruit trees, citrus, apple, and even ground application that was doing a really great job. Even like, you know, that uh, city garbage they you used to spray like there, and then there was no foul smell because yes. of the putrefying bacteria 
They were that uh, degradation was done by some other kind of bacteria than those uh, causing the, that bad smell. Yes, I'm aware of that. I'm also aware of a really clever project in Japan where they realized that when nematodes are released from the cysts, they're attracted towards the plant roots by a hatching factor. So they've synthetic made, I think it's a 68 amino acid peptide, and they're spraying the fields so that the nematode cysts are falsely uh, charmed into thinking there's a plant root there. And that's some really nice work that's also coming out of a, from a companion lab. So yeah, Thank you very much. Thank you. I've got a point to be made by a very successful biological controller. Of, uh, <laughs> right. Uh, I'm not going to ask for biological control here, but... Uh, you know, oomycetes depend a lot, to a large extent, on water. Yeah. So, it, so under the climate change scenario, I got two questions: What is going to happen to oomycetes? Number one, well, as then, as mm. a, as a class of of, of pathogen. Yes. And the second question is, <laughs> under climate change scenario, which are the diseases that you would expect to come up more in, in on, onto the scene as important? Yes. So, um, fungi are moving at 7.8 kilometers. Per, uh, per year in the northern hemisphere, oomycetes are moving at 5.8. So even though they're so reliant on humidity and surface water, they're still going to cause a big problem. Um, with regard to what are the major challenges, after the mildews, it seems to be the leaf spots within the fungi that are going to pr be most problematic. And I can see that from the modeling, there are going to be quite a lot of serious problems on pulses. Um, so there's another story coming there. But thank right. you. I've got two more questions, one from Susan uh, from Cooch, and then finally Morris. So I, I found it interesting that your higher expected incidence of disease would be on islands. I wondered if you'd done any correlations with just the tropical storm surges that we've been seeing, and, and would that be due to movement of these spores on air, on wind, okay. on tropical storms? Okay, that's, that's a superb question, because as far as we can see, most fungal pathogens, with the exception of rusts, don't really put their fungal spores up to travel very far in the atmosphere. So we know that Aesia spores from part of the Puccinia life cycle of wheat stem rust, we know they can go up into the boundary layer and spread 10,000 kilometers. But as far as we can see from the literature, it's very unusual for fungi to travel very far. They're mo almost all locally produced. But I don't think anyone has ever looked to see in some of these new tropical storms what is traveling. I think it would be a really interesting line of research. It's a good question. Finally, Morris. <laughs> if Susan had spoken earlier on, it would have triggered my memory. It was, it was actually about cisgenesis and biodiversity. So we've got uh, tomorrow a uh, DivSeq meeting all day here in Saskatchewan. And obviously one of the things we're looking at are the, the biodiversity of, among other things, resistance genes that are available in uh, species that are closely related to our crop species. Uh, so you mentioned cisgenesis. We saw the recent work by Jonathan Jones and mm -hmm. folks with, uh, uh, with uh, late blight and how rapidly you could mobilize those genes. What are a couple of targets that you would say are, um, are, we would go after using cisgenesis from closely allied species to our major crop plants? So in terms of major resistance genes or not? No, so I, I, I'm world's greatest cynic about stacking resistance genes, whether it's by GM or by conventional breeding, because we can see how quickly the pathogen can overcome them. And I think I mentioned quite controversially during the debate, we already have an example of where a, a barley cultivar called Klaxon was bred. It took a, many years of traditional breeding and they bred into it, I, I don't remember it was three or five monogenic disease resistance genes, put it out in the field and it survived three months. So I'm not quite sure. I think we have to be more uh, imaginative in what we do. I think we should definitely use monogenic disease resistance, but we have to be careful how we switch on and off genes, where and in which tissues, etc. So we need to be quite clever, I think, with the cisgenic design. That's a good point. Well, that was a wonderful point to end the discussion.